you done now? As they said in the film, Back to the Future, where are we going? We don't need roads. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Back to the Future, the podcast, the only podcast looking back in time at the greatest film trilogy of all time, Back to the Future. I am your friend in time, Brad Gilmore, and we have another special show for you today. Here we're wrapping up, guys. This is it. We're nearly done. It's over. It's over. Back to the Future, the podcast season four is done. Well, almost. But uh, I, I am happy to announce there will be a season five. In 2018, we will have Back to the Future, the podcast, season five. We're going to move on to bigger and better things. The movies are over, starting with this episode. Um, so let's get into it. We last left off here uh, in season three, talking about Back to the Future, part three. And we left off when Doc and Marty discovered Emmett Brown's tombstone where he was shot in the back by Buford Tannen over a matter of $80. And, you know, the statue was erected, or the tombstone was erected in memory of his beloved Clara. Doc says he doesn't know a Clara. So instantly after this, they go to the library. And when they go to the library, they start looking through all kinds of newspapers and, and, and old books and logs that the library has. First of all, I love this library. It looks awesome. I mean, it's a fantastic-looking structure. And Doc and Marty are going through it, and then Marty finds an article about Buford Mad Dog Tannen, obviously a relative of Biff Tannen, that we found out about first in Back to the Future Part 2 when Marty's at the um, Biff Tannen Casino and Hotel, you know, for where the old City Hall and Clock Tower were. And, you know, he found out in that little in in instructional video or informational video about Biff and his family, they found out Buford Mad Dog Tannen was a guy in the Old West, and it showed a picture of him. So um, they talk about how Buford Man Mad Dog Tannen had shot a bunch of men, you know, not including Chinamen or Indians, and, you know, shot a reporter for making an unfavorable story about him. Yeah, I think it was 12 men that he shot down. Uh, that's off the top of my head. I, I, I didn't really check that, but I think he shot down about 12 men, and Doc, it's, it's me. Does it mention me? Am I one of the 12? You know, and Mar Marty's like, no. And they're trying to find Doc in the, um, you know, Hill Valley archives. And, you know, Doc says, you know, well, you know, there, there weren't any other Browns then, you know, because Marty makes the case. What if it was a different Emmett Brown? It's possible 100 years ago or 70 years ago there was another Emmett Brown in Hill Valley. And Doc said, no, you know, the Brown family didn't come, uh, come into Hill Valley until like, the mid early 1900s. And then there were the Von Brauns. So, you know, there wasn't another Emmett Brown. And then Marty discovers, uh, you know, a picture where in a book that says History of Hill Valley, which I would love to own. You know, he sees this um, picture of, of himself, uh, kind of himself, but his family. And and uh, he sees William McFly, the first McFly born in America. Says so a good-looking guy because he looks just like Michael J. Fox. And then um, they find in that History of Hill Valley a picture of the clock tower, of the clock for the clock tower. And... There he is, Doc, standing right by Marty, or standing right by the clock, and tells Marty, so it is true. It is me who gets struck by lightning and goes back in time and gets shot by Buford Tannen. You know, what kind of future do you call that? And Marty proclaims to Doc, hey, that's not going to happen. You know, we're going to go back in time, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you home. So they use the schematics. I'm going to bring you home. So they use the schematics that um, 80, 1885 Doc found or wrote for Marty and, and 1955 Doc in order to repair the time machine. And they repair the time machine, but instead of going back to 1985, Marty, even though Doc says don't do it, Marty goes back for Doc 
and says, no, you know what? I'm going to. I got to save my friend. Just like Marty saved Doc from gunfire in the first movie. Let's not forget, you know, Doc was shot by those Libyans. Uh, Libyans. And, you know, Marty wrote him the letter in 55 and said, no, I'm not letting, I'm not letting it go down like this. And so he's doing the same exact thing now two films later, and he's saying, I'm not going to let Doc get shot. I'm not, it's not going to go down like that. So Marty and Doc Brown, you know, go back to the Brown mansion. You know, they fix it up, whatever. They go, um, and next thing you know, they're at a, an old drive-in movie theater. And I thought this was interesting. They go to this drive-in. And they do that because there needs to be a bunch of open space because Marty's not thinking fourth dimensionally. And I always loved this, you know, and this was a great thing by Bob Gale and Bob Zemeckis throwing that fourth dimensionally thing in there because not only do you have to think, you know, you're driving in the DeLorean, but in 1885, you don't know what's out there. In 1955, Doc lived in 1955, so he knew when he went over at the mall, he knew there would be... um. He knew there would be ample, you know, space for the time machine to run through that, you know, Twin Pines, you know, uh, farm, the old man Peabody farm. He understood that. So here you don't know what's in 1885, so they go out to a place that's all open space, you know, easy to navigate. And then, you know, Marty, of course, comes out dressed as Clint Eastwood, which is the best. Marty in that awful 1950s, like, Space cowboy. That's what I always thought it was. It was like a space cowboy outfit. He looked like, I mean, Clint Eastwood was in Space Cowboys. But uh, it, was a, it was an awful outfit. And he comes out and Doc says, you look great, Marty. And, you know, they, they pack up the, um, the hoverboard. They got the walkies. And then, um, you know, M- Marty still got on the air mags. And Doc said you shouldn't have those those on your feet right now, and Marty says, I'll change. So anyway, they get back. They get ready. The DeLorean's got white wall tires. It's got the time circuitry on, on the top of the hood, you know, with this kind of wooden apparatus holding everything together, and they go, boom. Marty says, "If I but if I go straight into that screen, I'm going to crash into those Indians, and that's when Doc says, oh, you're not thinking fourth dimensionally. Those Indians won't even be there. All right. So once again, we see the DeLorean go up to 88 after Doc... 1955, Doc's shooting in the air, and Marty goes through the screen, and literally, they're Indians. <laughs> the one thing 1955 Doc was so sure of, uh, Marty said, Mar- and Marty crashed into, there were Native Americans there. I should say Native American. There are Native Americans there on their horses, and uh, Marty has to kind of throw the DeLorean in reverse, and, you know, the cavalry's coming, and he uh, goes over, finds his cave, backs into a cave. He's safe and sound. And, you know, I, we all know what happens. He's got the arrow that's stuck in the fuel line, and the bear chases him off from the DeLorean. And he ends up falling over this hill, hitting his head on a on a fence. And he wakes up, and he meets uh, Maggie McF- McFly. Maggie and Seamus McFly. That's an awful Irish accent. And, uh, you know, meets them and meets... William McFly, first McFly born in America. Seamus feels connected with Marty. I got to say, Leah Thompson's got a good Irish accent. And people give uh, Michael J. Fox crap for his, you know, his uh, Irish accent. But I thought it was decent. I mean, I'm no Irish. You know, that'd be Davey Boy Mitch, former uh, co-host on this podcast. You could ask him about his Irish accent if, if Michael J. Fox was up to snuff. But I thought it was pretty good. You know, I have a lot of Irish relatives, and I, I thought it was pretty good. So, um... They uh, end up eating, you know, whatever he shot. He shot food. It was a rabbit or whatnot and drinking that awful, dirty, disgusting water. And, you know, he says, uh, Seamus says, I'm going to take you to the terrain tracks or show you where town is. I'll give you a hat. And um, Maggie, th- Maggie thinks for some reason Marty's going to put a curse on the house. And I never understood that logic. I guess that was like the old West mentality. You know, I mean. It wasn't too far before that. You had the Salem witch trials, so maybe they thought there was witchcraft, and it's awfully bad luck to bring a— in. the Irish are about their luck. Let's not forget, you know. Irish are about their luck, and I guess they didn't want to bring any, any bad juju on the house by letting an unknown stranger in, even though Maggie McFly should have thought this stranger was a handsome devil because he, he looks just like her husband. 
regardless. I never understood that. Never got it. Um, but, you know, they go into town, and then I think that shot when Marty gets into Hill Valley and there's that over, you know, crane shot where you see Hill Valley, you go over the top of it, and you see it's just this old town. I mean, it's still trying to figure it out. We're, we're just in the midst, you know, in the 1880s, late 1880s, into the early 1900s is when that industrial revolution really started happening. But the steam power train was pretty cool. And, uh, but many people still on horseback, old school mentality. It's not, we're not fully there yet. And you see just like all these like little, little places. You see the, you know, sheriff's quarters. You see, you know, um, you know, the butcher. You see the, um, all kinds of little things. The bath house it looks like or something like that. And Finally, Marty goes into a saloon, which is a, which is a good idea. I mean, everybody in the late 1800s, if you're a if you're any kind of gentleman, you're probably going to go in there and get a, a beverage. So it was a good idea for Marty to go in there and try to figure out where Doc is, because you know this is not the Hill Valley he knows. I mean, even 55 when he goes to 55 and tries to find Doc, he doesn't know really where Riverside Drive is and where Doc Brown was, and it's just another. Um, overarching theme in the Back to the Future trilogy where Marty's tr- constantly trying to find Doc. Where is Doc? Even when in uh, Back to the Future Part 2, when they're in the alternate 1985, he's trying to find Doc. He finds out, you know, Doc's been committed or whatever, and I guess Doc finds him. Um, but so many crazy things, uh, you know, in, in, in 85A, but I'm off topic. So, Marty's trying to find Doc. He goes into the bar, finds him, try to find him, Asked the bartender, have you seen uh, Emmett Brown? And then um, before he could even really say anything, Hey, McFly, I thought I never told you to come in here. And uh, Marty turns around, and then uh, Biff Tan- or B- Buford Mad Dog Tannen says, Oh, you ain't Seamus McFly. You look like him, though, especially with that dog ugly hat. And then he says one of my favorite lines in any movie ever which took me forever to figure out. It was, uh, he said, you know, you know, you look like him, though, especially with that dog ugly hat. Then he says, you kin to that hay barber? <laughs> I never knew what the hell that meant. Are you kin to that hay barber? Finally, I had to look it up, and I did some research. I think a hay barber is a farmer, an old-school term for a farmer. I guess. So are, are you um, related to that farmer is what it translates to. But are you kin to that hey barber is a fantastic, just a fantastic thing to say. I loved every minute of are you kin to that hey barber. <laughs> oh, shoot. <laughs> so anyway, uh, Marty starts, um, you know, kind of looking at Biff. He's like, oh, you're Buford Mad Dog t- and before, before, you know, Marty even realized it, he asked, have you seen that blacksmith to the bartender? No, I haven't seen him, Mr. Tannen. And that's when Marty puts it together. You're Buford Mad Dog Tannen. And then, uh, you know, Mad Dog gets mad. We see uh, Marty apologizing. He said, let's see you dance, boy. Starts shooting at his feet. And one of, uh, one of his... Uh, you know, uh, gang members, one of uh, Buford's gang members said, uh, what kind of moccasins is them? Uh, <laughs> what kind of riding is that? Knee K. And uh, <laughs> one of the, uh, one of the um, regulars, it looks like, at this bar, you know, I remember he said, he looks like he got that off of dead Chinese, you know, the, uh, the get up. And I, I know I'm all over the place, guys, but I, I just... You know, I'm not really good at breaking these movies down. I'm just kind of going through it and talking about how much I love the films because we can continue to break it down scene by scene, but I think the essence of Back to the Future Part 3, the reason why I loved it so much is because... So, okay, in Back to the Future Part 1, you had... You know, you had a lot of drama there. There was a lot of drama. There was, you know, Marty trying to make sure he was born because his mom is in love with him. I mean, that's kind of weird. And, you know, there was, there was the stuff of, of, you know, Biff and, and you know, being kind of a, you know, molester. I mean, there's there some dark overtones, right, in Back to the Future Part 1. And, and we know Back to the Future Part 2 
very dark movie. Um, but Back to the Future Part 3, for me, is the most fun. And I guess when I was a kid, it was, well, it was my favorite. Because it's just the most fun. And, you know, the, I mean, there are stakes, of course. But the stakes are, you know, the first one is of comedy, and the second one's a dark comedy, but this one's like a slapstick, Three Stooges-like comedy. And a lot of people say that's when it went off the rails, but I always thought this movie was so fun, and I think this whole scene in the bar is just fun. It's an old-school Western. It's the, you know, the town badass, you know, the gunslinger comes in, the gangster comes in, looking for somebody, because the way he sees it, the guy owes him some money, and then, you know, there's the, there's the, the spittoon that goes all over Biff or, or Buford. There's, you know, the dancing uh, with the K riding. There's the, the, you know, the women in there up top that look like they're just there, for, you know, if you need a good time. There's the bartender who looks like the most old school bartender ever. I just loved it. It was just fun. It was just fun. And then, you know, they string Marty up after Marty takes off running. String him up, pulling him through the town square. And they get right in front of the courthouse. It's, you know, we got a new courthouse. High time we got a hanging. And then that's when Biff, uh, not Biff, that's when Buford is stomped in his tracks by Doc Brown with this awesome looking gun. I mean, Doc Brown has never looked like more of a badass and said more, more things that were badass than in this moment right here. Where he, you know, he's just like, it'll, it'll blow the fuzz off a of gnat's ass at 100 yards and it's pointed right at your head. I mean, come on, man. Doc Brown was thinking about it. He wanted to make something happen. You know, I gotta love. You gotta love Doc for that. Doc Brown was. He was like, I am having no parts of your BS today, Mad Dog. Yeah, that that was the most gangster stuff I've ever. I think in any Back to the Future movie, anything. Probably if you look at the whole career of Christopher Lloyd, that was the most. You know, to use a uh, H Town term, that was the most playa thing Doc Brown ever has said. Pointed right at your head. I mean, come on. You know, and I don't know if it was blow the... Was it blow the fuzz off of Nat's ass? Is that what he said? Something like that. It was something like that. I might be mixing up my westerns. That might be another western that I heard that from. But still, whatever he said, when he says pointed right at your head, that's when you knew Doc was about business. So, uh, you know, he shoots you know, the rope, saves Marty... And um, Marty's getting up, and that's when he goes, "Hey, you know, um, yeah, you, know, you know, my my horse threw a shoe, and you know, and Doc's like, well, hey, bring him back, and I'll reshoe him. I shot the horse. So the way I see it, when it threw it off, it, you know, I broke a brand new bottle of whiskey. So the way I see it is, you owe me five dollars for the whiskey and seventy five dollars for the horse. And that's when Marty realized, okay, that's a that's the eighty dollars. I'm putting it together. I'm putting the p- puzzle pieces together." And then um, when, when Doc finally goes over to Marty, he says, Marty, I gave you explicit instructions not to come back for me. And Marty's like, Doc, I know, I know, I know. But he's like, ah, but it's good to see you. It's good to see you too, Doc. And then um, they get back to Doc's blacksmith you know, quarters and, you know, they're talking. And you see this awesome refrigerator, which was so cool. You know, we're just this whole contraption, this Rube Goldberg type thing with all these bells and whistles all there for the explicit purpose of making a single ice cube and it blows out the bottom there and iced tea you know marty says no thank you and um you know he's telling you know he's telling doc like hey man you know you know uh who's you know we got to get you out of here you know you're gonna get shot you know that's this monday the seventh, that's this Monday. And, you know, and Doc's like, well, I got to get out of here. And and then Marty starts asking about Clara. And, you know, Doc's like, I don't know any Clara. And Marty's like, well, maybe you meet her and you fall in love at first sight. And, you know, Doc's like, ah, oh, no, that's not possible. And they go through the whole thing. And turns out, you know, hey, Clara's the school teacher. The Doc said he'd help out whenever she got into town. And the idea, though, of him falling in, um, falling in love you know, at first sight, that's preposterous. And he wouldn't do that because he's a scientist and he can't, he could screw up future events. And Marty's like, hey, man, it's just, it just happens, man. It's just like lightning, getting struck by lightning. And Doc's like, Marty, please don't say that. <laughs> so that was a great joke. 
And um, then he's like, hey, well, you know, I can never fall in love with her if I never meet her. Marty's like, hey, you're right, Doc. And he's like, let's get out of here. And Doc's like, hey, uh, Doc, there's only one problem. You know, I ripped a fuel line, got hit by an arrow, ripped a fuel line. So we need to get some gasoline before we get out of here. And Doc's eyes get wide. And he's like, hey, you mean the, you don't have any gasoline? And then Marty's like, no, yeah, but you, you're Mr. Fusion. Uh, well, Mr. Fusion powers the time circuits in the flux capacitor, but the car itself is always run on regular gasoline, always has. There's not going to be a gas station around here until the early 19th, you know, was it, early 20th century. And then they start thinking, oh, crap, what are we going to do? And then you see them trying all kinds of things and, you know, bartender says the strongest stuff they got. And, uh, you know, they blow it off and Doc's like, oh, that's going to take a month to fix. I guess it was some kind of machinery. I don't know if it was a carburetor or whatever. I'm not the biggest car guy in the world. I don't know really what blew it out. I don't know what, even why they thought alcohol would help, you know, start a car engine. But I guess it's, it, hey, they were, they were trying. They were desperate. They were trying. So uh, Marty and Doc are trying to think about it. And I, and I love this. I love, you know... Doc's the scientist. Doc's the, the guy who made time travel possible. But he's still brainstorming with Marty, who's a high school kid, a senior in high school. He's still brainstorming with him, and they're trying to figure out the best way to do this. You see them getting pulled by, pulled by horses, trying to figure that out. You know, it doesn't get them up high enough. You know, they only got up to, what, like, you know, 45 or whatever. Then Doc has this idea, oh, well, you know, I got it. We'll wait for the lake to freeze over. We'll go down, you know, and, you know. And uh, everybody's like, winner, Doc, you get shot on Monday. And then this, this was the best one. This is one of the best little scenes here because I think they only had one shot to do this, to line everything up. They wanted to do this where the train comes by in one shot. And so Doc goes, you know, okay, we can't, we can't pull it up to 88 miles per hour, but what if we could push it to 88 miles per hour? Huh? And at that very same time, you see that train in the background. Do, do, right? And then Doc and Marty kind of go over there. And they figure out, okay, let's see if we can get this train up. And they start talking to the train guy. And he's and I love this guy, by the way, this train conductor. And um, Doc's like, oh, me and my friend here have a little wager. Could you get this thing up to 90? Went, 90? I don't know why I'm tarnation. Do you ever want to go that fast? But I... Get the engine hot enough, and you ain't pulling no cars behind you. And yeah, I think it's possible you get up to 90. When's the next train come through? 7 o'clock this Monday. So there you go. 7 o'clock this Monday. So, or 7 or 8, whatever time it is. And, you know, so there's already the time limit. Now, we've always talked about how it's funny they have a time machine, but they're always pressed for time. And even there, we, gotta, we have to have this thing push us up to 88 miles per hour. But it's not getting here to Monday. Monday is when you know, I'm getting shot. Crapola, this might not be so good. Anyway, though, they have the plan. They figure out what they're going to do. They have the little, uh, whatever you call it, little mo model that they're going to build a little bit later. But then when they go and they look out at the um, end of the bridge, Marty goes, well, you can scratch that idea, Doc. And, uh, you know, that, there again, Marty's not thinking fourth dimensionally. He says, yeah, I got a real problem with that. When we, you know, go to 88 miles per hour, go into the future, the bridge will already be completed, you know, in 1985. Well, you're, that's why you're the doc, doc. And then they hear the woman yelling. Hear the woman yelling. They look over. And they see this woman's carriage and horses are going crazy. She's flying, flying out of there. And they go to save her. So they run over. They save this woman from going over the, the edge into the ravine and, and uh, she looks up and she, you know, he, she says, I'm Dr. Brown. And she says, I'm Clayton, Clara Clayton. And he says, what a beautiful name. And right there you see the docs in love. Love at first sight, got struck by lightning. They take her back to um, her quarters. They thank her. I think they're going to fix the telescope, right? You know, he'll, he'll have it repaired for her. You know, he says he's a scientist, oh, I'm a blacksmith, and then, the, you know, they have this love of science together. I don't need to relitigate the whole movie, but I'm just saying. These are my favorite parts. I love this, though. I always love, like, so I went to a, um, 
my elementary school was Edgar Allan Poe Elementary and in Houston, Texas. And there was like this dark story about Edgar Allan Poe Elementary. And you'll see where I'm going with this in a second. Like in 1960, this guy came. He wanted to pick up his kid. They wouldn't let him pick up his kid because, you know, he didn't have him in the divorce settlement, something like that. So the guy comes back later and has a briefcase with a bomb in it. And he goes off to the playground. He sets this bomb off at my old elementary school. Like I said, 1960s. Sets this bomb off and he kills himself, his kid, another kid, like a, a teacher and a janitor. So the janitor, right, I, I can't remember his name. Uh, I think it was like Will Rogers or something like that. But we always had this story at, at Poe. Whenever you'd go into the restroom, they, were, they had these big mirrors in there. If you turn the lights off and said this guy's name, you could hear him cleaning up the restroom, and then he'd appear in the mirror, right? So it was like this old tale that we would tell. And, you know, to scare people or scare kids we didn't like or whatever, you'd tell them the story in the restroom and freak them out and shut the door and try to scare them, right? I know it sounds awful, but, you know, you're a kid. You don't know any better. So that was always the story that went around Poe Elementary. Well, I like when Marty tells this story. He tells a story about how, you know, Clayton Ravine, you know, a hundred years ago, there was a teacher that fell in the ravine, and all the kids know that story because they all think about the teachers they like to see get thrown in the ravine. And it was called Shonash Ravine, you know, that Doc pointed out earlier. He looked at the map. Shonash Ravine must be the old Indian name for it. Hmm, whatever. You know, and uh, by all the time you actually see Claire in the background. A little Easter egg there, but go fast forward. You know, he goes, oh, that's why it's called Clayton Ravine 100 years ago. And Doc goes, 100 years ago? That was this year. Oh, what have I done? You know, I may have destroyed the space-time continuum. And Marty goes, ah, so what's the worst that could happen? The ravine doesn't get named after or whatever, you know. And so Doc goes, oh, you're right, but this is just another reason I need to destroy that infernal machine. So they, um, they go back. They have their plan. And then they're ready um, to go to... This dance, you know, um, Clara Clayton invites them to the, uh, what is it, the town, the town um, parade or festival or whatever it is, the Hill Valley Town Festival, whatever it is. And um, she goes, you are attending, aren't you? Oh, yes, we will be there, you know. And they go to the, um, they go to go to the uh, town hall festival. I don't know what to call that. I can't remember what it's called. And uh, they get into some more drama, some more stuff going on. And that's something we're going to talk about in the season finale of Back to the Future, the podcast, here on Back to the Future, the podcast, season four. I'm your friend in time. I'm your friend in time, Brad Gilmore, and I will see you in the future. Oh, Brad, what have you done now?